you being the judge for so many years, county court judge, and behind you was a portrait of Robert Jackson. Do you know the story how it got there or anything about that? Um, I do not. I made some inquiries uh, from some of the court personnel and I, you know, the only person who probably would have known who I never thought to ask was Lee Town Adams ah. because he, he knew everything right. <laughs> and he never forgot right. anything. So he would have known the story of how it got there. But there are, um, interestingly enough, some people think it's a portrait when they first see it of Governor, former Governor Rockefeller. And there is a resemblance. One of the employees in the court system, when I first ascended to the bench, made a comment to another employee that it was kind of, um, uh, I don't know what's the right word, but for me to have a portrait of myself hanging on the bench, a little uh, self-centered or whatever. And no, it's not the portrait of John Ward, and I don't even think there's any resemblance, but she apparently thought it was that it was me. But that was quite an honor, and a lot of times, many times, Greg, um, people, we'd have a jury trial, for example, and there'd be a break, now, let's say, well, the attorneys have questioned the jurors, and they're going over their notes, and they're getting ready to make their challenges, and. And I try to chat it up a little bit with the jury, just so it's not dead silence in the courtroom. And I'll explain to them that the portraits in the courtroom are all fine, former county court judges. And then I point to the portrait behind me and I explain, you know, Justice Jackson and his history as Solicitor General and the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Prosecutor and the Nuremberg Trials. And um, People are fascinated. They've come. They've told me afterwards. Some of the jurors. They said, "You know, thank you for telling us about that." A lot of us were wondering who that man was up there because the plaque is too small to read from the jury box. Sure. So, I always considered it quite an honor to yeah. to have that portrait in the courtroom. Also, during that period of time, um, the, there are jurors usually fourteen in the jury box that have just been questioned, and then there are still the and they're still prospective jurors. They haven't been challenged or qualified yet. And then there are, like you say, there may be 50 to 75 people sitting out in the courtroom on those hard benches. And so while there is a break, for example, when the attorneys are getting ready to decide who they're gonna challenge for cause or peremptorily, um, not only do I tell them a little bit of the history of the county court and that type of thing, but I also tell them, stand up and exercise. Because those seats, those pews, whatever you want to call them, where the <laughs> three prospective jurors, they're solid wood. There are no cushions on them. They are not comfortable. And to have to sit there for an hour or an hour and a half is not a good thing. So, and I said, you know, feel free to chat among yourselves. You know, just no, no loud. We don't want to disturb the attorneys. But, you know, if you want to talk to your neighbor or your person sitting next to you, Go ahead. So I tried to make it make yeah. it as comfortable for the for the jurors. I mean, it is a sacrifice for a lot of these people. Were you destined to be a lawyer? Don't know that, Greg, because uh, I wasn't even sure when I was an undergraduate at the University of Rochester what I wanted to do. I just wanted to basically get a liberal arts education, so it would kind of leave a lot of possibilities for me when I graduated. But I worked for a year after I graduated college. I worked for a year for a, actually for a hardware lumber company in Mayville. And it was partly owned by my first wife's uncle. Mm -hmm. And boy, I learned a lot of stuff there. I learned how to thread and cut, cut and thread pipe and cut wood and, you know, rip saw and uh, replace panes of glass. Anyway, and I enjoy working with the public. But at one point I said, you know, then they explained to me that they were looking to possibly have me take over the business. And this was before the big box stores started coming in, the Home Depots. And I knew that these small hardware and lumber companies were not gonna be around for a long time. And I remember discussing with my first wife at the time you know, maybe I'll try, maybe I'll apply to law school. Mm -hmm. And back then, the environmental movement was just starting to get traction. 
And I thought, and I might become an environmental attorney. So I applied to several schools, and I wound up getting accepted, among others, at the University of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And being an in-state school, and being an in-state resident, the tuition was really cheap back then. Right. And so there was a year between my undergraduate and my law school, but I got through okay. I, fortunately, I passed the bar exam the first time. And I passed the bar exam in May of 1975. And it was shortly after that, I think through the, partially through the efforts of my late good friend and senior investigator in the DA's office, Tony Caprino, who was also good friends with the district attorney, Bob Sullivan at the time, mm -hmm. that I was offered a full-time position in the district attorney's office. Right out of law school. I'd worked, well, I'd, no, I law school, I graduated in 74. Okay. And then I took the bar exam in like September of 74. The results probably didn't come out till till May. I, I, well, no, they came out in February, but I wasn't actually sworn in up at the appellate division until May. So it was right after I became, you know, I worked for a local law firm for a year, and it was right after I was admitted to the bar that this opportunity to start to work as an assistant district attorney. And it was full time, and the pay back then, this is 1975, for a starting attorney, or, or, you know, who really doesn't know much of anything. I mean, I learned how to do real estate closings and things like that when I was working with a private firm. But I didn't know anything about criminal law, and the salary was $20,000. Wow. And back then, that was a big chunk of money for somebody just starting out. And Bob Sullivan was the DA, and Paul King had left the district attorney's office to actually run against Bob Sullivan in the Republican primary, which he won and eventually won the general election. But so was I destined to become a lawyer? You know, I just, it was one of those things that after I'd actually worked hard for a living for a year, I think I decided maybe I'd rather be, do something <laughs> like practice law where I don't have to lift sheetrock and do things like that. <laughs> And it was just, we were talking, and it just it, it popped into my head, and I started thinking about it, and I said, what the heck? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out some applications and see what happens, see if I get accepted. And I did, and then I quote, sort of fell into the job in the district attorney's office, and I loved it immediately. You said you had a year of private practice. Who did you work with? It was, I think it was, at the time, it was called Ledestro, Bailey, and Erickson. Okay. And they gave me a beautiful office. I mean, it was really nicely appointed, well furnished, and the legal secretaries there were outstanding. But I wound up on my desk files of cases that nobody else wanted to touch. <laughs> and um, the pay wasn't that good, but I wasn't worth that much. I didn't really know that much. But I did learn some things about, and one thing about the, 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 the Jamestown bar. When you're a young attorney just starting out, you could pick up the phone and call just about any lawyer, say, I've got a question. I've got this thing that's come up. I'm doing this. I'm reading this title search. I don't understand this. Could you kind of help me out with this a little bit? And the older, experienced attorneys were more than glad to help out the new younger ones, uh, you know, put them on the right path. And I always found that very, uh, a very, um, I'm not just rewarding, but just the spirit among the attorneys in Jamestown was so positive and um, the camaraderie, I guess is the word that I'm trying to search for, was fantastic. And even the new young ones that just starting out, you could always count on the older experienced ones to give you a hand, to give you help, to show you the way when you needed it. And I always thought that was really, I don't know if it's unique to Jamestown, but it helped me a lot. And others. Uh, so that first year, just out of curiosity, they give, you the, they give you the grunge stuff. They give you the town court stuff, probably. Do you remember any crazy experiences your first time walking into a town court? As an, walking, a, yeah. as an ADA? Well, and, well, just even as a private attorney, where you walk in and you're lost. 
You don't even know where the men's room is. I didn't do any court appearances when I was in private practice. It was mostly um, office work. Yeah. Okay. And thank God for legal secretaries who know what they're doing <laughs> when it comes to real estate and things Amen. like that. But when I became an ADA and I walked into justice court, and I was going up against some well-seasoned criminal defense attorneys who knew their way around. And yeah, at first I was lost. I didn't know anything about what the policy was in the district attorney's office as far as a plea. You know, when were you allowed to take a DWI down to a driving while impaired? Uh, when were you allowed to take a misdemeanor down to a violation? Uh, what, you know, what criteria did you have to consider? I went in Bob Sullivan's office one day, <laughs> and, and I said, can I talk to you, sir? And he said, certainly. I said, now, I've been doing this justice court for a couple of weeks, and I'm not really sure what the policy is for the office. And, you know, what I should be able to reduce and what I should say, no, we're going to either plead or go to trial. Bob Sullivan said to me, don't worry, kid, you'll figure it out. <laughs> So I went in, and Tony Caprino, who became a fast, a very close friend of mine, had been um, investigated with the public defender's office, and he was now the senior investigator, the only investigator, but the title was senior investigator with the district attorney's office. He said, why don't I come around with you? I kind of know my way around justice courts and the attorneys, and I'll, I'll help you out for a few weeks. So he did, and that, that, was, really, that was really good of him. But I'll tell you one interesting story. I was trying a speeding case in the town of Ellicott. And I can't remember who the justice was at the time. It might have been Ed Jackson, but I'm not sure. But it was, it was just a simple speeding case. And John Goodell was defending. And I went through all of the um, introductory stuff, you know, laying a foundation for this, the radar. You know, they had to use a tuning fork and everything. And I did, and I had the, the trooper, or the officer, went through all the testimony, told me who the driver was, you know, the name on the license, registration. Went through everything I did, and I sat down, said the people rest. John Goodell immediately got on his feet, looked at me and says, I hate to do this to you, John, but you've failed to identify the defendant in court. <laughs> <laughs> Judge says, he's right. <laughs> so, he, the judge had to find him not guilty because, you know, there's no evidence that the person sitting in the chair, you know, being accused was the same person that the trooper stopped because he never, I never asked him to identify. So that's the kind of mistake you only make once in your career. Never again did I forget to have whoever needed to identify the defendant in court. And then I even um, asked, sometimes would ask the defendant to please stand up. But, Anyway, that's, that, that's one of the, I guess, the interesting stories from my beginning, you know, the trial by fire and learning by the mistakes. You, you mentioned seasoned defense attorneys. There's sort of a defense attorney bar, people who, when they got into some difficulties, would reach out to. Who were some names that, you, mean, you mentioned John Goodell, who were some of the others that you would no was a it was seasoned when he walked into court. You know, surprisingly enough, um, uh, attorneys like Willard Cass, I, I guess, I don't know if he's senior, it would have been Steve Cass's grandfather, you know. Yes. Steve is a surrogate judge, his dad was surrogate judge, well this was his dad's father. And he had to be in, in his 70s easily, and he was out there representing people in justice court. And he knew what he was doing. Uh, guys like, there was a gentleman named Sam Lombardo. Yes. That name certainly probably means something. He would be out in justice court d defending cases. Every once in a while, guys like Dobby Burgett would show up. And it was probably a client that was, they had a big personal injury suit going and got himself jam her, herself jammed up and Dalton would appear and, and represent them in justice court. Um, Dick Slater did some defense work back then. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Did Mike Lombardo, did you pass across with his at all? Did he what? Mike Lombardo, maybe Sam Lombardo. No, no, Mike is who I'm talking yeah, about. Mike, yeah. yeah, Mike Lombardo. Yeah, yeah, Mike, yeah. Yes, he was the one. I don't know where I got Sam from. 
he was a he was the one that I uh, he would uh, show up in in justice courts and guys like that the judges really respected and listened to and a young green ADA didn't have an awful big advantage just because you represented the people of the state of New York when you're up against guys like Mike and some of these veteran attorneys who the judges a lot of the judges were approximately the same age so they'd sure. probably been before them many many times yeah. um, to, but yeah Mike and I was surprised that I think they just like to get out and do it there, there are a couple of others whose names escape me now, but um, oh, they were they were they were tricky. Some of them they were sly. They would they would try to pull the wool over the judge's eyes. They'd be making arguments, and I'd be showing them the law, and they'd be coming up with something. Now, oh, there's a case you know that I read. I don't have it right in front of me, but this case held such and such. So it was an interesting time, and there was one one particular judge. A town of Poland. His name was Alonzo Sears. Mm -hmm. He was the judge. He's not not, a, not an attorney. He was a farmer, dairy farmer. And we'd have what we called calendar calls, where we'd the lawyers would come in, and the assistant DA would show up, and we'd go over the cases and see if we could settle them you know, without having to go to trial. And there were some times when Judge Sears, who was actually a very good, fair judge and a very intelligent man, but he was not an attorney. And he'd literally come in from the barn with his barn boots on into his little office, and immediately the whole place reeked of manure. <laughs> hey, he didn't notice it. He didn't smell it. He smelled that all day. But the rest of us sitting in there were like, oh, man, can we settle these and get out of here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but well, yeah, some of that, and then there was one of my favorite judges was uh, town judges back in the day was um, Gordy Ost. Mm -hmm. Bemis Point, Town of Ellery, Justice. And he was always full of stories. And, uh, and then without fail, it was, it was his, his calendar call was late afternoon. So it was quitting time, you know, not going to go back to the office and then leave. I would just go home, except Gordy would say, come on, we're going over to the seizure house, I'm gonna buy you a beer. <laughs> and so we'd go over there and have a couple of beers. And, then there was up in the town of, when I was first appointed as an assistant DA, there weren't, there was Bob Sullivan, the DA, Park Cashpool, who handled the felonies in Jamestown, Bob Seidel, who handled the misdemeanors in Jamestown and Ellicott, Bill Foley, who handled pretty much most of the northeast end of the county, plus the city of Dunkirk, and I had all the other towns in the south end, all the way from the town of Carroll, all the way up to the town of Hanover, Cherry Creek, Ellicottville, uh, not Ellicottville, um, Ellington. And so I was out almost every night because most of these judges had daytime jobs. Yeah, yeah. And, but I remember the first time I went up to the town of Hanover and Jack Kohler at that time was a chief of police of the town of Hanover Police Department. I think Silver Creek and Hanover both had police departments. And his office was right around the corner from the courthouse, the courtroom. And it was the first time that I'd ever been up to the to that courtroom. And I was getting ready for calendar call. And I was there early. And Chief Kohler at the time said, why don't you come back to my office and let's have a cup of coffee and just chat for a while. I said, sounds good, you know. I'm, I'm a DA, assistant DA, I want to get to know law enforcement, I want to be on the good side of law enforcement. So he fixes me a cup of coffee, and we sit down, and he's on one side of a desk, I'm on the other side, and he says, all right, so now let me tell you how things work around here. <laughs> but he didn't steer me wrong. He was telling me how the judges thought, how they, you know, and, uh, you know, how, how things were in. But th there was a little bit of a hint of, you know, when we make an arrest, we make good arrests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what about Ed Jackson? I mean, I, I again, I was a, just a couple years younger than you, but certainly he had a reputation. Ed Jackson did. He was um, a very fair man, an intelligent man, and 
as a prosecutor, when you walked, to his, walked into his courtroom, in some courtrooms as a prosecutor, by virtue of your position, you kind of have an edge over the defense attorneys with some of these judges, not with Ed Jackson. You better be prepared. You better have all your ducks in a row. And if you're going to go to trial, you better have your evidence. You better have everything right. Or if you're going to come into our calendar call and discuss the case, you better know your case inside out because the defense is going to know your case inside out. So he was, he was one of my, I don't want to start picking favorites, but he was, I, I, I have to say, one of um, my favorite judges to appear in front of because you always knew you were getting a fair, fair shake, and the defense always knew they were going to get a fair shake from Ed Jackson. He was, he was an elegant, right? He was kind of elegant judge. Uh, and B and Stowe. Uh, Art Thomas. Art Thomas, yeah. He was also an excellent judge and a very intelligent man, um, college educated. And he um, was a very astute um, and involved town historian. He compiled a lot of the history of town and North Harmony. And I think he put it into a book, into book form. And uh, he was a very interesting man to listen to because he had a, a real sense of local history. And he was the type of individual that even after court was over and everybody else had left, I'd like to sit around and just chew the fat with him because he just knew so much. And when you're young and just starting out, whether it's an older attorney, whether it's a judge that's been around for a while, get to know them, try to be on their good side and learn from them. Because they've been around the block a few times, and you know we haven't, as you know, young attorneys just starting out. So really, you, you're an ADA, you're a district attorney type guy. You're working for Bob Sullivan. Bob is subjected now to a primary yes. with Paul King, and, and I, as I recall, Paul won. He did. And then, uh, then who did he run against in the election itself? It was a four-way race. Oh, okay. Because. Bob Sullivan had also gotten the Conservative Party endorsement. Okay. Uh, so Paul King ran, he won the Republican primary, he ran as a Republican. Bob Sullivan ran on the Conservative ticket. Ed Fagan ran on the Democratic ticket. And Bruce Carpenter ran on the Liberal ticket. Oh, so it was a four-way race for district attorney. And it was, it was very interesting. And that's, I think that's how I first got to know Ed Fagan, who, if, if you knew him, I'm, I'm sure you did. He, he was quite a character. He uh, was. He, and it, frankly, a lot of prosecutors didn't like the way he handled himself in court. They thought he was, under, I thought Ed Fagan was brilliant in court. And he would come up with some very unique arguments to present before the judge, or at least to make a record of, so if there were a conviction, he would have that preserved on appeal, even if it was a new and novel type of objection. And I think Bill Arison was a master of that, and he was probably the most active criminal defense attorney with, uh, back at the time. Both, and he became, um, I think he was the first public defender in Chautauqua mm. County, if I'm not, not mistaken. But he was very active. I see him a lot out in justice courts. And Tony Caprino was very good friends with Bill Arison. They both lived in Lakewood. Um, and Tony Caprino said to me, Bill Arison paid you a really good compliment the other day. I ran into him. And he called me a name, which I'm not going to repeat on camera, but it started with a P and it has to do with a certain particular body part. And he said, that ward's a real, and Tony said, coming from Bill Arison, that means he thinks you're good. Ah, that's great. That's great. Uh, so you, the election, Paul wins. Was there any question you would hang on? I mean, is, was that a, was the office political in a sense? No. Um, Shortly after he won, Paul sat down with me, mm -hmm. and he offered me the position to stay on. Yeah. But what he wanted me to do, and this probably if I had said no, he probably would have revoked the offer. He wanted me to take a pay cut of a couple thousand dollars, maybe 2500 or something like that, because he wanted to increase the pay of, of Bob Seidel, 
who handled the misdemeanors in Jamestown and Ellicott. Mm -hmm. And Bob hadn't been able to get a raise, and Paul had, you know, the legislature hadn't come up with the money, and he said, Bob Seidel deserves a raise, and if you're willing to take a, a cut of, I think it was $2,500 from the $20,000 salary, I'll keep you on. And it was for a, a split second, Greg, there was that, in the back of my mind, I was like, what are you asking me to do? You know, why should I? But I immediately abolished that thought before it came to the front of my mind. And I said, oh, Paul, no, no problem. I want to stay. I really like this job. And if, you know, if I have to take a little cut in salary, you know, that's fine. Because let's face it, I knew eventually, you know, there'd be step increases and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be making more money. And it was still more money than I've ever made other than when Bob Sullivan was here, I did take a slight cut, but it was still a, a, a very decent wage back then. And my first wife was working as well as teaching. So, you know, I really, I, I barely gave it a thought. I, I just thought, you know, I'd be stupid to say no. Sure. So, and, you know, ironically, the way it turned out, you know, Paul King was in office. This would have been in, uh, he would have taken office in, 1976, and he'd only been in office, in, I think a year and a half maybe or something, before he was killed uh, in an accident on his farm. I mean, it was nothing intentional about it that anybody ever came up with, but he was a very, he was 38 years old when he died. Very good man, excellent trial lawyer. Um, he could bond with a jury. He was one of us, you know, he was one of them. He didn't come out, out with a thousand dollar suit on or pinstripe. Well, I mean, he would just, you know, not an aw shucks type guy, but he could talk right to the, to the level of the, and I don't mean talk down, but you talk, it was because some lawyers actually will talk down to a jury, but they want to show off their smarts. Um, the good ones can get right down and, and talk, the same language, and, with the, with the, and Paul was really good at that. But then, obviously, there became a vacancy in the DA's office, and a special election was called for that fall. It would have been the fall of 77. And that was for a full four-year term, and a lot of positions now when you run, if there's a vacancy, you just run for the balance of the term, mm -hmm. but this was for a full a four-year term. And the Democratic Party appointed an attorney from Dunkirk to be uh, their candidate. And back then, it was common practice for the governor's office, if the governor was of the same party as the candidate, to then appoint that candidate as the acting in this situation as the acting district attorney. So my opponent in that first election, oh, Dave Civilette. I mean, there's no secret, sure. this is David Civilette. And Dave and I have always been friends, always we've gotten along, and the campaigns were never nasty. Uh, but, um, so he was my boss, as well as my opponent. And I think it's the way the Post Journal put it. We were, we were boss and employee during the day, and um, political rivals at night. You know, going out and speaking to different groups. And, um, but yeah, so David was, and I, I think what he should have done was fire me, just get me out of the office. But instead, we had, I think, four pending murder cases mm -hmm. at the time. And of course, Paul was in charge of them, but I was working closely with Paul King on those cases. And a couple of them, I was the first, Tony Caprino and I were the first to arrive at the scene, because Paul lived up, way up near past DeWittville. And a lot of the homicides back then occurred in this end of the county. So I was very familiar with them. I had attended uh, several autopsies, and um, so before before Dave Civilette was appointed by the governor, Bill Foley was had been named by 
Bob Sullivan to be the acting district attorney. After, so after Paul King was tragically killed, Bill Foley was named, so automatically those homicide cases were transferred to him. So I went up to see him one day. I said, how bad do you want to handle these cases? He says, I don't want to have anything to do with them. He said, are you, he asked me, he said, do you feel comfortable handling those? I said, absolutely. I was in on the ground floor on all of them. I know, you know, who all the players are. And I've learned, I learned a lot from Paul and from Tony Caprino. And I said, yes, I'm very comfortable. He said, they're yours. I said, okay, thank you. And Dave Civilette comes in the office, gets appointed DA, immediately takes them away from me. Well, that got him a lot of negative publicity in the news media. And he took them all except for one that what might have, that was likely to go to trial, possibly anyway, before the election. And it was a case right here in Jamestown. He gave that to Bill Foley. And uh, Bill Foley said, no, I'm not you, I, you know, fire me if you want to, but I'm not gonna handle that murder. So David had all the cases to himself. And he was, most of them we knew weren't gonna go to trial until after the election. But he didn't want to risk going to trial and maybe losing a, a, a homicide case. And the one case that was going to trial, it was a case that was really ripe for uh, a manslaughter verdict, okay? It was, it was a real heat of passion type case. But the, the fellow had been indicted for second degree murder. But it was one that uh, ultimately he was convicted by a jury of manslaughter, you know, extreme emotional disturbance defense. But after the election, I had be defeated Dave Civilette, and he called me at home one night, and he said, John, um, this was going to go to trial now after the election, but before I became district attorney, but I was still an assistant DA. He said, John, if you want to try this case, I'll give it back to you. I said, David, you took it, you keep it. <laughs> you want to fire me? Go ahead. And believe me, I... I did pull a few, not, nothing unethical, but I would, when he was DA, we did have a couple of, of homicides, and I would be the first on the scene working with the police. And one time he was speeding down from Dunkirk, and he got stopped on Savannah Avenue by the police, <laughs> and he had to show his credentials and everything. So I'm on my way to a homicide, saying I'm the district attorney. So obviously, they let him, they let him proceed. But little things like that, and he even one time said, John, these cases are not yours. I don't want you having anything to do with them. And, you know, they're my cases. I don't want you to have anything to do with them. I said, David, listen, one of us is going to be district attorney after the first of the year. It could be you or it could be me. I'm going to keep myself up to speed on these cases, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it and want to get rid of me, fire me. Well, that probably in the beginning would have been the politically expedient thing to do because I would have not had the platform that I had as an assistant DA. Okay. But now he kept me on and then he took the cases away from me and then, like I said, I, I had, it, had built up enough comp time that I had enough money to live on till the end of the year and I was hoping I would win the election. If I didn't, I, would, I had a promise from a couple of firms where I could uh, get a job if I, if I didn't win the election. But fortunately I did, but he did try to pass that case off on me and I said no. And he tried it and uh, he got a manslaughter verdict, with, which was probably the right one. But he really, once he knew he wasn't going to be DA, he wanted, didn't want to have anything to do with that. But then he ran against me. I became judge after Lee Town Adams retired. I was an an assistant DA for three years, district attorney for 15, which meant going through four elections, countywide elections. I was county court judge for 23 years, 10-year terms, which meant going through three. So altogether, I went through seven countywide elections in my career. I didn't know. Yes, and the first time I ran for re-election for judge, after I served in my first 10 years, I was unopposed. Not cross-endorsed, but just unopposed. 
Then the second time I came up for re-election, David Civilette, who had tried to get this nomination for Supreme Court, because Do Jurassi was no longer in, uh, sitting in Mayville, he had, had reached the mandatory retirement age. Um, even though he had gotten recertified and could still hear cases as Supreme Court judge, the seat was gone. So Civilette was trying to get the nomination for that, Dave Civilette, and did not. And then the next year, I think my position came up, and he decided to run against me as county court judge. And I had gotten in a little disagreement with the chairman, then chairman of the conservative party, because for years and years and years, if you got the Republican endorsement, the conservative party endorsement just followed. It was, you know, it was just the way it was. Well, I'd gotten into a, a disagreement over uh, with the conservative party chairman. He wanted my office to go after some people. He said there was some fraud and some petitions on the conservative. And there were two, two competing groups in the conservative party competing for control, okay? And we went out and Tony Caprino, an investigator, he interviewed these people who supposedly didn't sign petitions or weren't, they weren't witnessed or something was wrong. And they all said, no, this was absolutely done on the up and up. So I went back to the chairman and I kept trying to get a hold of him, kept trying to get a hold of him. And finally he said, John, we think you really dropped the ball in that investigation. I said, Ed, what are you talking about? I'm not going to tell you his last name. And he said, you were supposed to take that case to the Supreme Court. I said, what case? I said, we went out and interviewed everybody you told us was involved, and nobody gave us any indication of any wrongdoing. What case am I going to take to, to the Supreme Court alleging any kind of election fraud? Well, we just think you dropped the ball. So they endorsed Dave Civilette. Well, no, I ran a primary against Dave Civilette. He'd already gotten the Democratic endorsement. So, so he now he got the conservative endorsement. But in a judicial race, you can have a, you still run a primary even though your opponent is, has the endorsement of the, the, the party. So David won the conservative primary. And so now he's running on two lines, Democrat, conservative. I'm running on just the Republican line. And it wasn't even close. I, I mean, I, I, I just... I, I don't know if it, I, I had a good reputation or what it was, but I won the election very handily. And David was the first to call me and congratulate me and said, you know what, you're going to be judged for as long as you want to until you have to retire. And he and I always have remained friends. You know, he's, he's, he's a hard guy to dislike. I mean, I just like him. He's most, one of the most courteous attorneys in court. And after this was not too long before I retired. Just when, um, I think it was President Obama at the time, was thawing in relations with Cuba and allowing certain visitation, certain people to, to, to go there. Well, somehow David had gotten in some group or something, and he'd actually gone to Cuba. And so after court was over and everybody was leaving, he came, he said, may I approach? So I said, certainly. So he came up the side of the bench and he pulled out his like a, a Cuban cigar and handed it to me. Now, I wasn't a, yeah, and I wasn't, I mean, I liked the case of a cigar. And I went home that night and I, for, we had a bottle of, uh, of red wine in the cabinet. So I cracked that open and poured myself a glass of red wine. I went on and got my easy chair, lit up that cigar, took a couple of puffs, a couple sips of wine. Really doesn't get much better than this. It was, the, the cigar was so mild and so tasty. I, actually, there was a phone right on the table next to my chair. I called David at his office. He was still there. And I got right through to him. I said, Dave, I want to tell you what I'm doing right now. What? I, I told him. And I said, I'll tell you what. Thank you very much. That was very considerate of you. And this is the best cigar I've ever smoked in my life. So, I don't know, it's never, anybody ever ran against, there were never any hard feelings sure. afterwards, except my last election for judge. Um, my opponent really got, went very negative against me, but, and I'm not gonna mention who it was, but um, I still won the race quite handily. You keep mentioning Tony Caprino. Yes. Uh, and frankly, uh, my wife, Cindy, 
uh, of course, uh, was very much involved as the first clerk, and also a female, obviously, uh, for Adams and Cass. So she was kind of in that world there, yes. uh, sends her best. And, um, but, but when I think of John Ward, I think of Tony Caprino. When I think of Tony Caprino, I think of John Ward, kind of tied at the hip. Is that accurate? It's very accurate. We were very close, both personally and professionally. Uh, there's an expression that I heard, and if I, I want to get this right, is common sense is genius in working man's clothes. Mm. That's Tony Caprino. Mm -hmm. I mean, working man's clothes, obviously he wore a coat and tie to work and everything. But he, in my opinion, was a near genius man. And he had uh, common sense. He had more common sense than most any people I know. And there are a lot of times when I would have to make a decision, when I was DA especially, where I would go in his office, close the door, say, all right, here's the problem. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. Here are my options. What do you think? Who say, option number one, put that away and forget about it. Because <laughs> that's going to come back and haunt you. And this is why. And he would lay it all out for me. So he would give me a lot of advice. And some people thought, Caprino's really running the DA's office, not Ward. I said, no, Ward is running the DA's office, but Caprino has given him the advice he needs to help run that office. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, we, we socialized a lot together outside of the office. And we were, yeah, like you say, we're almost joined at the hip. Any serious criminal investigation, we both were involved in. Uh, before a case would go to trial, we learned the hard way one time that because this was the day and age when discovery was becoming pretty open and the prosecution had to ch share with the defense pretty much all the evidence that they, that they had, especially if it had been seized with a search warrant or search of the defendant's residence or someplace where they had an expectation of privacy. Well, right the day before we were scheduled to select, a, I'm not even going to say what police department or anything like that. The day before we were scheduled to select a jury, Tony was interviewing the police officers. He said, now do we have everything that you guys collected? I don't know. And the officer said, well, I've got one undeveloped roll of film that I took at the scene. It's in my locker back at the police headquarters. I said, what? Because you've got to show them all the pictures. And um, so we got it developed. We immediately informed the defense. He said, and I, he said, these are just duplicates, basically, of the other pictures you already have. I said, doesn't matter. We have to have it. So Tony went and got the, I don't know how he did it, but overnight he got those pictures developed, and we had them in the defense hands the next day, and they looked at them and looked at them and compared to what they already had been provided by us. There's nothing new here. We're not going to ask for a continuance or anything. This, so from that day forward, one of Tony's jobs was about at least two weeks before a trial was scheduled, he'd go to whatever police department was in charge of the investigation. He said, I want to see your entire file and go through it and then compare it with what we had to make sure that we had everything they had and didn't get surprised in court. But he was just a mar remarkable man. And of course, you know, he was for many years the mayor of the village of Lakewood. Mm -hmm. And he kept getting reelected and reelecting elected, and some people, you know, loved him. And he, he had, you know, like any elected official, especially at that level, he had some people who didn't like him. And he didn't care. He called the shots the way he saw them, and he always, whatever decision he made as mayor, was in the best, in his opinion, the best interest of the village. Whatever his decisions he made and advice he gave to me in the DA's office was in the best interest of the office and the people that we represent. And even he worked for, I think Jim Subject followed me as district attorney when I was elected to the bench. And he was still working in the office. And there were some times when I would pick up the phone, back channel diplomacy, I guess you call it, and talk to Tony and I said, we got an issue coming up here and I can't tell you who's involved and who the parties are. And it's gonna be totally anonymous, but just give me your take on this. And he would, and thank you. And so he was still somebody I could turn to yeah. 
for advice even after I was out of the DA's office. And it was nothing unethical. I wouldn't tell them who the parties are or even if it was, even if it was a real case. I said, let's take a, he knew it was a real case, but I would say I would, everything in hypothetical terms. But um, he would, he, he, you know, I didn't always take his, follow his advice because sometimes I disagreed with him and I thought I was right and he was wrong. But most of the time I would have to say that his, his sense of his common sense was superior to mine. And sometimes I would show him a letter I was going to send, maybe to an attorney, maybe to somebody, a, pissed, a, a, a mad letter where I was complaining about something or griping about something. And I'd show it to him and he said, put that in your desk, lock the drawer, take it out in two days and read it again, see if you still want to mail it. Nine times out of ten I would never mail it. We've all done that. We've Attorneys done do that too. You know, you, you react to something instantly, you pick up the dictaphone or whatever you use nowadays, you dictate this nasty letter, and then you stick it in the desk drawer. So I'm going to read that in two days, see if I still want to mail it. So Tony often would be in court with you. Yes. And were there, in your course, the prosecutor, you're the uh, district attorney for many, many years, and taking on some really tough cases, and there's the way it's laid out, there's there are you and Tony, and then there's the space, and then there's the defense counsel and defendant. Were there any times during those sort of prosecutorial moments where the, you were concerned that the defendant, because you're obviously prosecuting him, laying out evidence against him, that he would be emotional and kind of react? Were there, were, were there moments in time of that in court? There were certain defendants that of course, they always had courts. They, whenever court security, when I first started, was non-existent during regular court hours. There were unarmed people there, basically showing people how to get up to the witness stand. Or, um, but if if the accused, the defendant, was were in jail, there would be two plainclothes deputies assigned to sit right behind him or her just to make sure that there were no shenanigans. If he or she tried to get up, um, they weren't shackled. And uh, because that obviously has a prejudicial effect on jurors, if someone's in handcuffs or even leg irons, unless you can hide them. But there were a number of defendants where you know, when the testimony really came down to the, the nitty-gritty of the case and the, the se severe accusations against the person, you know, you wondered, is, is that, I don't know if there was ever a woman that we were concerned about, um, but there were several men that I was concerned about might just jump up and start over and head towards the prosecution table and try to get in a couple you know, before the security could stop them. And they were, there were two plainclothes armed deputies seated right behind so they could jump up and, and tackle him or her if necessary. But one time, there was one particular nasty defendant. There's an older gentleman from Erie, and he had been indicted for murdering a 19-year-old mm -hmm. uh, Erie woman. Um, who he was, uh, she was doing, she was do, turning tricks, and he was her, I don't want to use the word, but anyway, something went wrong, and he wound up uh, shooting her, and brought the body to Westfield, and it was, the body was discovered on the railroad tracks in Westfield. Now, in, in New York State, and a number of jurisdictions, the homis if it's a homicide, which it was determined to be, it's presumed to have occurred in the jurisdiction where the body was located. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a presumption, and you know what, as a lawyer what a presumption means. It means it can be rebutted if you have sufficient proof. Well, uh, Bruce Carpenter was defense attorney. Bruce and I tried several cases together, and I like to try in cases with Bruce because he knew how to get under Leton Adams' skin. He just knew how to do it. And, and uh, he would try to get under the other lawyer's skin, but he, he could never get to me. 
but some lawyers take the, and Bruce was one of them, if I can just make the judge mad enough that he makes a decision that's wrong and this is, my client's convicted on appeal, I might have an appealable issue. His defense in that case was that the homicide occurred in Erie. Therefore, New York State did not have jurisdiction. And he even had, at that time, Paul Andrews, who be, ultimately became my law clerk, but he was working as an investigator in the public defender's office. He had him go out to the defendant's apartment in Erie and actually cut up a portion of the rug and had it examined uh, by some, some expert down here, I can't remember, and it was determined that there was human blood. And they couldn't type it or anything, but it was determined to be human blood. So they wanted, Bruce wanted to get that carpet entered into evidence to show that this young lady had been shot in the defendant's apartment in Erie and had died there and he just transported the body in the trunk of the car and dumped it in Westfield to throw the police off. Well, I objected. So where's that carpet been since it was uh, collected by Mr. Andrews? Well, I think we had an offer of proof outside the presence of the jury. And Paul Andrews says, well, I rolled it up and I took it to my house and I kept it at my house. And it, was, it was there for several months. I said, Judge, that was not kept in secure custody. We don't know what kind of contaminants it might have been subjected to. Um, I object to its admission. And, uh, and I, I think I asked Paul, I said, did you look, for example, when you collected that rug, did you look at the ceiling to see if maybe there was a leak and something could have dropped down in the apartment out in Erie? You know, maybe there was a toilet, maybe there was a bathroom up there, and some, and this was pre-DNA evidence time. I said to the judge, I said, we, we have no idea, you know, this, whether or not this, this evidence is contaminated. It's been, it's been in Mr. Andrews' house. We don't know what else is, I mean, I, I, Mr. Andrews, I know, was a clean man, and <laughs> he has a clean house, but we don't know what it might, and Judge Adams agreed with me. They didn't, he didn't allow the carpet in, so the jury convicted him of murder. But the same man, he was, I think he was about 65 years old, and he was one of the meanest defendants we'd ever had. And he died in Attica. So I'm not going to besmirch his name even though he killed somebody. There's no question about it. But a couple of interesting things. You asked about somebody maybe going off in court, a, a defendant. Well, we had taken a, a recess and the jurors were filing out of the courtroom and the defense, and we were all standing, we were standing getting ready to go out of the courtroom and Tony had the file and it was in one of those large boxes that, you know, all law firms have, those cardboard boxes. And as the defendant walked by him, he reached back and he took a swing at Tony and Tony held that box up and that caught the, caught the punch. And then the police, the deputies, immediately grabbed him and got him out of the courtroom. But um, <laughs> Tony would not mind me saying this, rest his soul. This guy that took the punch at him just did not like Tony Caprino. He was always glaring at him. And he used to call him the chunky flunky. Because if you remember Tony, he wasn't very tall, and he was a little bit on the say muscular side. And he was a very strong individual. I wouldn't have not wanted to tangle with him. But that's the only issue, that's the only time I remember any actual violence. And it turned out to be nothing. I mean, if the guy had, if the guy had hit him, Tony would have, I mean, the, the police were right there on top of him in no time. But if it had been one-on-one -on -one between the two of them, there's no question in my mind, Tony would have prevailed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about Lee Town Adams. You were his successor. Yes. You argued a lot of cases before him. Uh, he certainly had a, a reputation. And kind of, kind of talk about him, because you're probably as close as anybody to Judge Adams. He was... Um, at times temperamental. Certain attorneys knew how to push his buttons and make him mad. To the point where he'd pound, he wouldn't use a gavel, but he'd pound his fist on the bench and say, no, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, 
The court reporter, Paul Keating, uh, who was the last one to actually use shorthand with a, you know, with a uh, pen, a uh, fountain pen. Now, he would never put down Judge Pound's bench. And he would just repeat the judge's words without any emphasis or anything like that, because Paul and, and Lee Town were very, very close. But he was good to me. Uh, some attorneys, he never took a shine to, and they always seemed to get a hard time in court, on both the defense and the prosecution side. He just, I don't know what it was. He was a hard, hard individual to, 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 to figure out sometime. Very intelligent. I think he had a photographic memory. Um, he could, when you'd go into his chambers, Greg, I don't know if you ever went in when he was judge, but he had a large conference table in the middle of the room, and he had a desk off to one end of the room. And the conference table was literally this high in different papers, decisions, uh, law review articles, whatever, think, whatever you can think of. The same with his desk. And so we'd be up having pretrial conferences in his chambers. Maybe an attorney would bring up an issue, and he said, I really think that issue is pertinent in this case. And the judge would say, wait a minute. And he'd walk, get up and walk down to one end of this, this conference table. He'd f flip through and he'd pull out this piece of paper. Said, I got it right here. <laughs> he remember, he knew everything that he had on that table. And he knew exactly where it was. And he was just a remarkable man. I think he um, did the New York Times crossword puzzle every day in ink. <laughs> I mean, he was, but he was very good. And uh, Tony Caprino was at one time, amongst his many accomplishments, was the chairman of the Republican Party in Chautauqua County. And back in those days, the, Rep the enrollment edge for the Republicans was way over what the Democrats had. So if you had a Republican nomination, you were virtually guaranteed to get elected. But anyway, Tony was uh, worked to help get Lee Town Adams the Republican nomination. He had been a defense attorney, and his predecessor, uh, Edwin O'Connor, had, I think, passed away. And so the position was open, and Tony was instrumental in helping uh, as county chairman, he had some influence with the state Democratic Committee. I don't know who all was involved, but he was instrumental in helping Lee Town Adams get the Republican endorsement. And he ran against uh, former Dunkirk City Court Judge uh, 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 no, Jankowski. Uh, Augie Jankowski. And uh, who, you know. I don't know if he was sitting as a city court judge at the time or not. But anyway, it was a countywide election, and back then the cop population of the county was probably about 160,000 people. Now, I don't know how many registered voters they were, but Lee Town Adams won that first election by less than 300 votes. Landslide Lee. Hence, hence the name Landslide Lee. <laughs> And of course, Augie Jankowski went on to become a, a, a splendid uh, city court judge in Dunkirk, one that was um, just fair to both sides. He wanted to see the right decisions made. And of course, yeah, he was blind. And we always used to kid him, and he didn't, you know. You know Boy, in your court judge, justice really is blind. And he would laugh. But he was a, he was a fantastic man and a wonderful judge to appear before. Yeah. But Lee Town, to get back to your question, he and I always got a lot, got along fine. Um, he sometimes, and, and I used to, to do this too, once in a while. Um, and it's, it, it probably, it probably borders on the, or gets near the border of the judicial canons of ethics and things, what judges shouldn't, shouldn't do. But Lee Town would do this, and I kind of picked up on it from time to time. For example, the judge would always, if someone were indicted for a felony, it would, unless they waived indictment, it would be via the grand jury. The grand jury is a group of individuals 
who listen to the prosecution's evidence and decide if there's reasonable cause to believe somebody committed a crime. Well, part of the judge's duty, and it's always part of the motion that the defense makes, is the judge review the grand jury minutes to make sure the evidence was sufficient to, to sustain the charge. So Lee Town Adams, he'd be reviewing the grand jury minutes, and he wouldn't call any of the attorneys in the DA's office, but he called Tony Caprino. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm reading the minutes on such and such a case. I think I'm going to have to throw it out. Unless you can get some kind of deal that everybody's happy with. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Click. <laughs> so there were a few times that I did that because you knew by looking at the grand jury minute, they could represent it. The judge should give permission to represent it. And it, it could have been they left out something that they should have put in or something like that. And if it were clearly, I mean, if the prosecutor uh, is engaged in misconduct before a grand jury, there would be no, no phone call like that. It would get dismissed and it, without, with prejudice, you know, because, and I, I, I can't ever remember seeing a case where there was any intentional misconduct on the part of a prosecutor. There might have been some negligence in, in not presenting everything they had, but I, I you know, because they knew the grand jury minutes were going to be reviewed by the judge. So I can't ever recall any serious misconduct, you know, other than, you know, allowing in some hearsay and stuff like, we all used to get away with that, especially if it was harmless, you know. But, uh, but there was, a, there were sometimes those, those backdoor channels. And the same thing with the public defender's office. Um, I, I would sometimes call them and I said, look, um, I think this case is one where you might want to reconsider the DA's offer. Because I just read the grand jury minutes, and if it comes out of trial the way it came out in the grand jury, it looks like you're facing a, a conviction. So now I'm not telling you how to do your job, I'm just telling you where I'm coming from. I'm not the jury, so I don't really know. Thank you, Judge. Click. Call the DA's office, and the case would get settled. Yeah. So I, I guess, it, 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 you know, it, I don't think it's totally unethical, but I think um, some people would say, hey, any contact between the court and either, either party, you know, ex parte, would be unethical. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I would always let the public defender know or whoever the defense attorney knows that sometimes when I read the grand jury minutes and I think, you know, it might be ripe for a reduction, I might give them a call. Do you have a problem with that? Not at all. The DA, I'd say, sometimes if I think your case is really good and the defense are digging their heels in, and it might be not that the attorney may want to take a deal that the DA is offering, but the, the defendant, him or herself, may not want to. Is it all right if I call the defense counsel and tell them that I think they should take the offer? Absolutely. But I would never talk to the lawyer. I always talk to an investigator. Yeah. Lee Town was the same way, and that way uh, the word would get passed on. And it, it was just kind of a way of settling cases and avoiding a trial where one shouldn't take, have to take place.